So good, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate and honor your willingness to spend a little bit of your precious time with me. Hopefully you'll find this information useful. Just in the way of introduction, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brian Sanderoff. I'm a traditionally trained pharmacist that at some point in my career, after owning a couple pharmacies in downtown Baltimore, um, got tired or uh, weary of giving people prescription medicines to help treat their chronic diseases, realizing that those medicines really were not treating those diseases, but just sort of uh, turning the volume down on what the body's saying. And so I you know, started to look for a different way to help people, different tools to use to understand what was going on with people in their, um, their health. And so um, um, I uh, sort of switched uh, horses and started working with herbs and nutrients and had a different understanding of biochemistry and the way the body works. And so I'm really excited for today's topic because um, I really wanted to take the time to address what people may be hearing about, reading about, especially if you watch TV and you listen to Dr. Oz or that kind of stuff. And then also to make sure that I address the things that I think are really important for us to know and understand and to know about and understand in the supplement world, because I think these you know, ones that I'm going to talk about in the beginning here are really up and coming supplements that, that we're going to hear more and more about. Just like 10 or 12 years ago on my radio show, we were talking about vitamin D. Now, of course, you're seeing all of these studies come out and all of these recommendations for taking more and more vitamin D, much higher dosages than the RDAs. And uh, my contention would be that the things I'm going to talk about today, in you know, somewhere in the near future, you're going to be hearing more and more about, and maybe already are. So let's go ahead and hit it. And I, I do see that I have a question from John about niacin, and I'm going to keep that question up here, John. And when we get to the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about niacin for you. So I appreciate that question. And again, for other people, just type into the little question area on your control panel and I'll see it right away. So here it is, your supplement research update, or we could also title that going beyond the essential six. And those of you who have listened to me before and heard me talk about my essential six, those are the six supplements that I think that everybody needs to be on. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to just cut it off at six. And so these may be seven, eight, nine, ten in importance of taking them. And, you know, as I go through this, you may see that some of these have uh, more implications for you as an individual and what's going on with you health-wise and or genetics-wise and may say, wow, that may be something I want to add to my regimen as well. So number one on the list is iodine. And I can tell you that um, this is a very well understood and very poorly respected supplement. And these are the reasons why. So number one, let's talk about the functions in the body of, uh, of iodine. So it is needed for normal growth and development. And that means for adults, that means for kids, that means for fetal growth and development as well. There's actually a condition that's known as cretinism. I, you may have heard the terms cretin or heard somebody call somebody a cretin. Well, there's actually a medical term for cretinism and it is um, an extreme iodine deficiency. And leads to extreme deficiencies in growth and development, both physically and mentally. And so um, there are whole villages or were whole villages of folks in Southern Europe, in the Alps, where cretinism was actually very common. And it was discovered in the you know, 1800s or um, 1900s. And as it turns out, it's a extreme iodine deficiency. It really speaks to the importance of iodine in um, development of physical growth as well as mental growth. And so um, there are less extreme deficiencies of iodine, and generally they show up as goiter. And a goiter is just an, sort of an overgrowth of the thyroid gland. And um, there are areas in the world, including the Midwest of the United States, that um, have been known as the goiter belt or as goiter belts. Europe as well, areas of Europe. And really, these are just areas that, um, that the population were not getting enough iodine. And um, usually it's in the landlocked areas where you're not getting exposure to seafood and or um, the soil that food is being grown in doesn't um, 
get replenished by seawater. And so you become iodine deficient. And when you become iodine deficient, the thyroid um, can start to act funky. And one of the ways that it can act funky is start to try to overgrow. And that's where you get a goiter. And when this was discovered, at least in the United States in the 20s, um, and it was understood that iodine was playing a role with this, that's when they started iodizing salt. That's when they started to put iodine into salt, table salt. And it made the goiter problem in the United States practically go away within a matter of, um, you know, just a few years or a decade. Um, and so iodine is really, really important for a lot of function. Um, if you look in the body, you will see that there are concentrations of iodine in many tissues in the body. And these are the tissues that you can look at. Uh, thyroid, salivary glands, um, brain and cerebrospinal fluid, lining of the stomach, breast tissue, ovary tissue, skin, thymus, joints and bones, um, and even the arteries. All of these areas can concentrate iodine in the body. And there's a, a, a bit of biochemistry which is called the sodium iodine pump. This is a mechanism which the body will use to get iodine within certain tissue. And all of those tissues that I just mentioned there, all of those areas where iodine can concentrate in the blood, I mean in the body, they have this active sodium iodine pump. And so just regular logic would speak to the idea that iodine is particularly important for the function of all of these tissues. If you've got skin tissue and there's an active sodium iodine pump within the skin, Logic would dictate that, well, iodine must be pretty important for skin function. And as we'll find out, it actually is very, very important. Um, so where does iodine come from? And uh, let me just apologize for going quickly through some of this information. I have a lot of information I want to discuss uh, today and only limited time. The truth is, is that every one of these supplements that I'm talking about, I could spend an hour talking about with you and educating you more about it. And so uh, I'm you know, giving you the Reader's Digest condensed version here. So where does iodine come from? Well, number one, it comes from the ocean. And it's really, really interesting that the action of the waves at the seashore creates iodine gas. Once that iodine is airborne, it combines with water and air and can enter the soil where it's then taken up by the plants. We can eat the plants and get the iodine from the plants. It's also absorbed through the skin. And this will become significant when I talk about testing. But this is also, it's very interesting, but this may be why many people will report feeling sort of better or rejuvenated after visiting the shore, after going to either a seaside resort or just going to the ocean, that they actually feel better, they feel rejuvenated. And one of the possible reasons why this can get reported wholesale, lots of people reporting it, is, is that actually when you're there at the ocean, you have exposure to iodine. And when we have a deficiency, getting that exposure to iodine makes you actually feel better, just even coming in from your skin. Um, iodine also comes from seafood and from seaweed. And of course, as you know, it comes from iodized salt. salt. And this started back in the 1930s when we started iodizing salt. And again, we did that as a direct result of recognizing that the middle of the country, um, people were starting to get goiters or starting to show having goiters and realizing that that was related to a lack of iodine. So why is it that we're deficient today and how widespread is that deficiency? Well, first of all, let me point out that the RDA, the recommended daily allowance of iodine is about 150 micrograms. That's 150 micrograms. Now, it has been estimated that the Japanese people may actually get as much as 12 milligrams of iodine every day. And that's because they live on an island where the soil is constantly being replenished with iodine. And then they're eating the foods that are grown in that soil, as well as eating a tremendous amount, especially compared to Americans, of seaweed and seafood, which is iodine rich. Okay. Um, so why are we deficient, though? Because we've had changes in salt consumption, right? We've been told to lower our, our salt intake for various reasons, whether that's supposedly to help lower our blood pressure or to, you know, maintain cardiovascular health. And because iodine, salt is a major source of iodine for us, dietary-wise, that's one of the reasons why. And then we've also seen that other sources of iodine have actually changed. Iodine used to be used as a dough conditioner for bread making. 
And in the early 80s, bread makers started using bromide as a conditioner instead of iodine. So this caused a two-pronged problem. Number one, we weren't getting the iodine from the bread that we were eating. And number two, bromide is actually a mineral that competes with iodine for absorption and uptake into tissues. And so not only were we getting less iodine from our food, we were also introducing into our body something that made it harder for our body to use the iodine that we were getting. These are all the reasons why we become deficient. And the deficiency is pretty widespread. What are the ramifications of those deficiencies? Well, number one, there's thyroid function. Iodine is needed to make the thyroid hormones and to help the body convert from one of the thyroid hormones to the other, from the inactive one to the active one, from T4 to T3. And the thyroid is the, um, the part of the body that concentrates iodine the most. And so in a deficient state, when there's only a certain amount of iodine available and it's not enough, thyroid will snarf up and use all of that iodine. And that ends up leaving other tissue that needs iodine function, iodine to function properly in a deficient state. So the best, the next, uh, you know, tissue that needs iodine to function properly is actually breast tissue. And it's very interesting because Japanese women have a much lower incidence of breast cancer than American women. And the hypothesis is that it's because they have so much iodine in their diet. You know what the estimates are today for women in the United States to develop breast cancer? One in seven. Now, we've got more than seven women listening right now. We got, you know, so think about that. One out of every seven of you women that are listening right now, there's a likelihood that you'll get breast cancer sometime in your life. Do you know what that number was 30 years ago? That number was one in 20 women. So it's gone in 30 years from 1 in 20 to 1 in 7. Do you know that 30 years ago was the time when iodine consumption changed in the United States? And 30 years ago, our iodine consumption, just with our regular food, without trying to do anything extra, in salt and in bread, as I talked about, was twice as much as it is today. And there are many, many people, including me, who believe that that is a direct result, you know, that the direct result of that decreased iodine in our diet uh, has led to this increase in cancers. And it's not just breast cancer, other immune function. Every cell in your body actually needs iodine. And as I pointed out, all of that tissue, all of those different tissues in your body concentrate it and or need it for specific function. And one of the things that iodine does with immune function is help assist in a process which is called apoptosis. That's a fancy medical term, and basically what it means is programmed cell death. What it means is it's the process of cells remembering to grow old and die instead of stay young and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. What I just mentioned to you is another way of saying cancer cells, because cancer cells basically are cells that have forgotten to get old and die. They just keep reproducing and reproducing and eventually become you know, a tumor. And so iodine assists in that process called apoptosis, that process which means cells learning and remembering to grow old and die. So how do we test for deficiency? There's a couple different ways. There's a urine challenge test that you can do. And what you do basically is you take a big dose of iodine and you um, uh, consume it. And then you collect your urine for the next 24 hours and you send it off in a lab at, to a lab. And they see how much of that loading dose of iodine actually went into your urine. The theory being that if most of that big dose goes into your urine, then your body has all that it needs. And if very little of that dose goes into your urine, then your body used up and retained all of that iodine, and that's an indication of, uh, of sort of a deficiency state. Now, there was a time when I was recommending this test and doing it for patients, and I can tell you that I didn't see anybody who, re who didn't retain iodine when we did those tests. There was nobody that we tested that didn't show up as deficient according to that test. Now, there are some practitioners who believe that that may not be the most accurate way to test because they question the body's ability to absorb that big dose of, of iodine anyways. 
But there's a different test that you can do that we call the skin patch test. And this is really what I recommend. Now, again, remember I told you that uh, one of the reasons that people may feel good when they go to the shore is because they absorb iodine through their skin that gets aerosolized from just the wave action. And um, so your body will absorb iodine through the skin. And so what you can do is just go to the pharmacy and get that little bottle of iodine liquid and paint on a one inch by one inch square on your skin somewhere, you know, on your arm. And you know iodine is that, you know, reddish color, right? And so you paint that on and then you see how long it takes for your body to absorb that skin. If 24 hours later, you can still see that square, that is probably a fair indicator that you have adequate amounts of iodine. And if that square goes away quicker than that, and many people that I have do this test will find that within a couple hours that iodine has gone off their skin, then um, that is an indication of a deficiency state. And I think that you know, most people that do this test find that they do need extra iodine. So how much do you supplement with? So this may be a little bit controversial as well. So I will tell you that the RDA is probably too low. Again, that 150 micrograms is not enough. And again, I would point to the fact that our iodine consumption 30 years ago is twice what it is today. And we've seen an increase in a lot of different diseases, including breast cancer, as I had talked about, over those past 30 years. And so, you know, the RDA is probably not enough. We probably need to at least double that. There are some practitioners who actually suggest taking 12.5 milligrams every day. Now, again, the RDA is in micrograms. And so this is, uh, you know, this is um, uh, uh, moving that, uh, that decimal place uh, to the left from micrograms to milligrams. And so um, you're talking about a, a, a high dose. And there's a supplement that we use that's called iodorol, which is actually 12 and a half milligrams per tablet. And I use this a lot clinically and get some pretty good results. Iodine comes in different forms. There's iodine and there's iodide. Iodide is simply the salt form of iodine. So iodine is the, you know, is the mineral. And you can see potassium iodide, which is the potassium salt of iodine. Different tissues in your body use different forms. And so it's important if you're going to use this clinically to get a combination. And so that iodorol product that I, that I mentioned is actually half iodine and half iodide. And that's the way that you get the different forms for your body to use. So some of the iodine goes into cells just by diffusing across that membrane. And then some of the iodide is taken into cells actively by that sodium iodine pump. So hopefully that's, uh, that's clear. Um, and so uh, the only caution I have with you know, with uh, supplementing with that high of a dose is if you are on a medicine for thyroid function, I would want to sort of have a conversation with you to talk about the dosage that you should be on and how to monitor how things are changing. But I can tell you that I have a lot of patients who, you know, use iodine or that product iodorol and have been able to get off of their um, prescription medicines for thyroid function because of that. All right, the next supplement on the list is vitamin K. And this is another really, really big one that I think that, you know, five years from today, it, number one, I think it'll be on my essential six list. I might have to expand that. Um, and here's the reason why. It has a couple of functions in the body. Number one, very important role with bone health and very important role with heart health. And I'm going to talk to you, explain to you how right now. So vitamin K, bone health and heart health. Here's where uh, I usually apologize for um, getting a little bit crazy with the biochemistry, but it's important to understand this. So in your body, there are these things that are called GLA proteins. There's a couple of them that are important in relation to vitamin K. So one of them is called osteocalcin. And what this does is this little guy allows for the binding of calcium to the bone matrix. And osteocalcin cannot work properly without vitamin K present. When vitamin K is fully present, osteocalcin is fully active, and that's what helps tell calcium to go into the bone matrix and stay there. 
there's another of these GLA proteins, which is called matrix GLA protein. This is found in vascular smooth muscle, and its function is to stop calcium from depositing into the wall of those vessels. And you need vitamin K to be able to make this matrix GLA protein or to activate the matrix GLA protein. So I know that you guys have heard recently reports on the air that taking calcium supplement can be bad for your heart. And that, you know, I've got patients whose doctors are saying, don't take calcium anymore. Well, that's not really what you should do. There is a risk if you're taking a poor form of calcium and you don't have enough vitamin K because without the vitamin K uh, uh, being on board, supplementation of this calcium may actually lead to calcification within the walls of the blood vessels, right? And it's also been known that folks that are on blood thinners like Coumadin, which is a vitamin K antagonist, meaning it blocks the effect of vitamin K, actually being on those medicines doubles arterial calcification in humans. This is what studies have shown, and it makes perfect sense because vitamin K is needed for matrix GLA protein to work properly. And what its purpose is to stop the binding of calcium within those, uh, the walls of those blood vessels. And so having vitamin K levels elevated or higher, two effects. Number one, help build bone. Number two, help avoid having uh, you know, calcification of those blood vessels in your heart. Of course, what I'm talking about is blocking or you know, clogging of the heart, of the arteries, which leads to, you know, obviously, heart attacks and that kind of stuff. Vitamin K comes in a couple different forms. There's vitamin K1. Uh, that comes from vegetable sources, and it will get converted into the active form in the gut. The active form is called vitamin K2. So K1 comes from green leafy vegetables, right? Dark green leafy vegetables and some cruciferous veggies like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. So, you know, grandma was right. Eat your, eat your fruits and vegetables. Uh, the other form is called vitamin K2. This is the active form, and it comes from organ meats, egg yolks, ferment, some fermented foods. Now, you will also notice that, again, we've been told by medicine that we shouldn't be eating organ meats like liver or kidney, um, and we shouldn't be eating eggs anymore. And so this is another reason why we're deficient in vitamin K. Vitamin K3 is also a form of K. This is actually a synthetic form, and we do not recommend that you supplement with this at all. I think one of the prescription medicines of vitamin K is actually K3. And, um, you know, again, medicine is failing us and not understanding basic biochemistry here. So why are we deficient? Well, where do we get vitamin K from? Vegetables, and we have an extreme lack of those green leafy vegetables in our diet. Number two, lack of organ meat or egg. Same thing, because we've been told that they're not healthy for us. They're high in fat, blah, blah, blah. We shouldn't eat them. And number three, an imbalance of the good bacteria in the gut, because when we get the K1 form, which comes from vegetable sources, which is the one that we're most likely to get in our diet, the gut bacteria is what converts it into K2, which is the active form. And when we have an imbalance of the good bacteria because of antibiotics and stress and alcohol and all these other things, um, then we can't convert K1 into K2, which is the form that our body needs to use. And uh, I'll refer you to uh, a previous webinar that I did about probiotics and good bacteria and how important those are. Cool. Okay. So how much should we supplement with? Well, it depends on what our, uh, our uh, goal is here. If we're just looking for maintenance, probably 90 micrograms a day of vitamin K2 is sufficient. And there are different forms or different varieties of vitamin K2. What we usually use is one that's called MK7. That's, um, it's a chemical distinction that has to do with um, the, the form, you know, the chemical makeup of this vitamin K2. And so it's called MK7. There's a company called Jarrow, J-A-R-R-O-W, that makes a, a 90 microgram dose, and you just take one every day. That would be for just general health maintenance. So that would be for folks that want to maintain their cardiovascular health, for folks that want to maintain their bone health, maybe for folks that have a family history of cardiovascular and or osteoporosis issues. If we need to be more aggressive, meaning that we've got, you know, active 
cardiovascular disease. We know that we've got blockages in our arteries. There's actually some studies showing that increasing the vitamin K may help reverse that, may help pull those, um, you know, uh, the calcium deposits out of the, uh, out of the blood vessels or make it easier for your body to get rid of them. Or if you've got osteoporosis, you need to be more aggressive. We might use as much as 15 milligrams one to three times a day. And there's a, a company, there's a product called Ultra K2 by a company called Complementary Prescriptions that supplies 15 milligrams of K2 per capsule. And sometimes we'll, you know, go as high as uh, um, three of those a day. Um, the only caution that we would have with supplementing with vitamin K is if you happen to be on a blood thinning medicine like Coumadin. So, um, you know, in those cases, what we recommend is getting your vitamin K, not avoiding vitamin K, because studies have shown now, you know, it used to be when I was in pharmacy school, we were told, oh, if you have someone that's on Coumadin or, or warfarin, which is a blood thinner, um, that they can't eat any green leafy vegetables. And that's just not the case. And actually, they should eat green leafy vegetables every day. They shouldn't binge on them. But studies have shown that when you get small amounts of vitamin K2 or vitamin K in your diet, when you're on those blood thinners, you maintain your levels much more consistently. So uh, that's the vitamin K story in a nutshell. Um, next on the list is a supplement that's called astaxanthin, and that's a nice big slab of salmon. And that's one of the natural ways or places that you can get astaxanthin from. So what is astaxanthin? Well, it's one of the carotenoids, and so you've heard of Beta carotene, that is a carotenoid. You've heard of lutein, that's a carotenoid as well. Well, astaxanthin is another one of those carotenoids. And basically, what those are are the colorful nutrients that give color to food. So we know beta carotene and uh, you know is in what carrots? It's the orange color. Lutein is um, uh, you know, uh, in egg yolks, um, lycopene is another one. That's the red color that's in tomatoes and astaxanthin is the pink color. That's why you saw that big slab of salmon there, because that's one of the sources. It is a fat soluble antioxidant. Um, so it offers us protection from oxidation. And that is one of the main ways that we sort of succumb to our environment that causes damage in the body is through that process called oxidation. Every one of us listening here knows that process. You've seen it happen. Rust is the oxidation of metal, of iron. And it's the same thing that happens inside our body. We get exposed to free radicals, these unpaired oxygen uh, molecules, which are highly reactive, which means they attach themselves to um, other things and other molecules. And when they do that attaching, they either cause damage or render them, um, you know, dysfunctional. And so when we have oxidative damage to the cell membranes of a particular cell, then that cell can't function the way it's supposed to. Antioxidants are nutrients, and there's a whole bunch of different ones, vitamin C and E and beta carotene. And as we're talking about this very particular one called astaxanthin, sort of uh, fall on the sword for you. They uh, go around and they find those free radical oxygen molecules and quench them or grab onto them and stop them from doing damage to cells. So this is a fat soluble antioxidant, which is very important because when we talk about cell membranes, those are made up of fats and that's where a lot of that damage happens. That oxidation is also, um, uh, it's also about um, the aging process. Uh, many people believe that the aging process is actually caused by that process of oxidation. Um, it's what gives the pink red color to salmon and shrimp. That's the, that's the component there. So it's a very, very potent antioxidant. If you compare it to vitamin E, it's several hundred times more effective at quenching those and find, you know, finding and getting rid of those uh, oxygen free radicals. It protects phospholipid membranes of cells. And so again, this is what allows for those cells to either function properly or not function properly. Uh, it protects them from free radical damage. 
astaxanthin, this is one of the reasons why we get so excited about this product, is it is unique in its effect that it actually has an effect on both sides. That's the inside and the outside of the cell membrane. And that is kind of unique to this antioxidant. Other antioxidants will give protection on the outside, like vitamin C, or protection on the inside, like beta carotene or other fat soluble uh, antioxidants. But this protects both sides of that membrane. Also, it crosses the blood brain barrier. So, this is significant for, connect, uh, for protecting the central nervous system from oxidative damage. So, it can give you some cellular protection as well. Right? So let's talk about the studies because this is actually a very well researched and studied nutrient. These studies have been going on for more than 20 years now, although we're just starting to hear about astaxanthin as a supplement more in the mainstream. So I'm going to go through all the areas of the body that have been studied and you know what those studies say. So number one, with the eyes, it gets into eye tissue, it gets into the retina, it gets into the macula. And you know that a big concern that we have these days is macular degeneration. And medicine doesn't have an answer for that, doesn't have an answer to fix that problem. Basically, if you get macular degeneration, you go to your doctor or eye doctor and they determine that you've got that, basically they just tell you to go home and you know wait for that slow degenerative process where you're going to go blind. Um, astaxanthin also supports blood flow to the retina and it positively affects, as is what the studies show, visual acuity, focus, eye fatigue even after only one month of being on that supplement. So I've actually had patients call me back and tell me that their eyesight is improving from being on a proper dose of astaxanthin. Studies talk about vas uh, cardiovascular health as well. It's cardioprotective, and it actually has been shown to create a reservoir within heart tissue. Uh, it helps to normalize your lipids, so I'm talking about cholesterol, and protect uh, you know, the damage that can happen to cholesterol. And again, it's because... It's a fat-soluble vitamin that gets in and protects the cell membranes from the inside and the outside. It helps uh, relax blood vessels. It helps normalize inflammatory response. And inflammation, I did a whole webinar about this as well. Inflammation is really one of the key underpinnings to every one of the chronic diseases of aging. And so this is one of those things that can help uh, avoid that. Immune function, very, very important. It addresses both both ways that your immune system works. So number one, it helps to um, uh, increase natural killer cell activity. So natural killer cells are the ones that sort of go around and find cells or things that don't belong in the body, like cancers, and help to obliterate it. And it also increases the activity uh, and production of immunoglobulins. So this is the part of the immune system that responds to things that it's been exposed to before. So you get exposed to a virus or a bacteria the body will recognize that and create immunoglob immunoglobulins against that particular thing so that the next time you get exposed to it, you can fight it off. This is what happens to us when we get chicken pox, right? Get exposed to chicken pox, you get the chicken pox, they break out. That's a, a, a virus, happens to be a, a specific kind of herpes virus. Uh, and then you create Im immunoglobulins against that. And the next time you get exposed, you don't break out. That's why you only get chicken pox once. Um, skin health, very, very important. It offers antioxidant protection by getting uh, into skin tissue. Uh, it protects from UV light, targets changes in skin due to aging. It's a four-month study showing improvement in the appearance of skin, in the disappearance of fine lines, and increased skin density. And that's a big issue, especially as we age, because we all know somebody that if their skin starts to thin as they get older and people who the, you know, they can be as thin as tissue where you just even just bang the back of your hand on something and you start to bleed. So this helps to reverse that process as well. And then there's joint health. And so it targets inflammation from a genetic expression standpoint, meaning that there are many of us who genetically may be geared towards inflammation. That may be why we carry on with the same diseases that our parents have. And if we can do things that calms the genetic expression of that inflammation, then the diseases don't manifest themselves. And so um, from that genetic expression standpoint, there's over 300 different genes that are affected by astaxanthin in a positive way. Increases joint comfort and tendon function. There are studies showing that it helps with carpal tunnel, that it helps with uh, knee uh, joint issues, even trigger finger. And again, some of these studies show fairly short-term re results, meaning that, sorry, 
quick results, not short term, quick results, meaning that, you know, uh, you could be on the supplement in for six weeks and have carpal tunnel go away completely. Where do you get astaxanthin from? Well, you can get dietary sources that I talked about. Um, salmon and shrimp are, you know, one of the ways, but you have to be careful because it can be costly, number one, because you can't get the cheap salmon. You can't get salmon that's colored after it's caught and, you know, uh, that the meat is colored. It, it, it really has to be that, um, you know, sort of Alaskan sockeye salmon, which is the most expensive one. There's a reason why. Also, you know, eating a lot of fish, you can get lead and mercury and that kind of stuff. So we really don't recommend that you try to do it from dietary sources or you can do it from supplemental sources. Um, you need to make sure that it the source is actually microalgae. They, there are other sources of uh, astaxanthin like made in the laboratory. They don't work the same way. And so you want to make you want to make sure that it comes from algae, and on the label it should say that um, the 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 actual algae that it comes from is called Hemidococcus pluvialis, and you usually see that right on the label as well. And a dosage that all of the studies have shown is 12 milligrams a day, and so you'll find astaxanthin in a couple different ways. Lots of times it comes in four milligram capsules, and then you take three of them a day. But there's actually a a triple strength one as well that's 12 milligrams a capsule. And one to do a day of those. You also want to make sure, because this is a fat soluble vitamin, your body will absorb and use it more efficiently when it also comes with fat. And so they should be gel caps that also have some sort of oil in it. Usually it's safflower oil that's in there or olive oil or whatever. So uh, that's the that's the astaxanthin story. Haven't gotten any questions from you guys yet. Hopefully I'm doing okay. Hope that yeah, means that I'm just doing an excellent job, not that you guys aren't listening. Um, okay, so there are some other important supplements to consider, and again, I'm just going to sort of blow through these real quickly, and the reasons why I think that they're important to to note and mention. So number one is coenzyme Q10. So CoQ10 is a cofactor in the production of energy within every cell of your body. Um, maybe going back to high school or junior high chemistry, you remember the Krebs cycle, and that's where the body actually takes sugar and converts it into um, ATP, which is the currency of energy within the cell. That was a little play on words there. And CoQ10 is a needed cofactor in that process. Without CoQ10, your body has a harder time converting sugar into energy and using that energy. And if your body can't convert sugar into energy, it's going to store that for tomorrow. We call that fat. So your liver makes coenzyme Q10. You do not get it from any dietary sources. As you get older, your liver may be less efficient or less likely to make coenzyme Q10. And here's the kicker and why many people need to supplement with it. There are over 140 different prescription medicines that cause a deficiency of coenzyme Q10, including the statin drugs for cholesterol, the oral hypoglycemics, the pills that people take to lower their blood sugar, um, uh, beta blockers, which are oftentimes medicines that are used to either treat high blood pressure or protect the heart, um, and some antidepressants. There's a whole list of them. And it's really, really important to supplement with CoQ10, especially if you're on one of those medicines. Now, when it comes to CoQ10 supplementation, there's ubiquinol, which is the CoQ10. Sorry, ubiquinone, which is CoQ10, or you can supplement with ubiquinol, which is the active form. And that's what we recommend for anybody that's over the age of 30 or 35. Your body will be more efficient at absorbing and using ubiquinol than it will be at ubiquinone. A uh, typical dose would be 100 to 200 milligrams daily. There are some studies showing higher dosages can be helpful for certain kinds of cancer, including breast cancer, for high blood pressure, and for um, treating Parkinson's even. Really high doses. And um, to me, it's really interesting that we take these medicines like the statin drugs for cholesterol or beta blockers, and supposedly we do that for heart health, and yet we are interfering with our body's ability to um, you know, fuel the most important muscle, the hardest working muscle in your body with energy, and that's coenzyme Q10. Number two, I wanted to mention real quickly magnesium. This is probably one of the most underappreciated, most important nutrients that we could take. Um, estimates are that some 92% of us are deficient in magnesium from our uh, diet alone. 
And it's very important for uh, muscle relaxation, for nerve conduction. And it's the most, you know, it's very important for uh, osteoporosis. Um, it's what helps make the bones more flexible. And of course, what we're worried about as we get older with osteoporosis is bones breaking. And one of the reasons it happens is because they become less flexible. Um, very important for nerve conduction and heart health and for muscle function and a muscle relaxant. And so lots of times we'll use magnesium as a supplement uh, to help relax muscles at nighttime for sleep um, or for, you know, uh, uh, muscles that are too tense, you know, because of stress or whatever. And it's a natural uh, muscle relaxant for the smooth muscle as well. And so lots of times magnesium deficiency can show up in a tendency towards high blood pressure. And it's one of my favorite tools. It's sort of a natural calcium channel blocker, which is one of those prescription medicines. Um, we lose magnesium in our sweat. In our sweat. And uh, uh, some endurance athletes have had tendencies towards, especially bicycles, bicyclers, you know, competitive bikers. They sweat a lot. They're not necessarily building bone because that sort of exercise doesn't build bone. And they have a tendency towards osteoporosis as they get older. And it's because of the loss of magnesium. Uh, sports drinks uh, do a good job of replacing potassium and sodium, but not magnesium. And so when you're drinking Gatorade or whatever, you're not replacing your magnesium enough. Um, the other one I just want to mention real fast is vitamin B12. And just because uh, more and more studies are showing that it is um, important for uh, maintaining proper mental function as we age. And lots of elderly people, as they start to lose their memory and or get worse, you know, if it's uh, age-related dementia or even Alzheimer's, that vitamin B12 can help head that off and or reverse that. Uh, as, and the reason this happens in the elderly is because as we get older, our gut doesn't function the way it's supposed to, and we have a harder time absorbing B12 from our diet. And so we use the active form of B12, which is called methylcobalamin, not the cheap form that you'll find in most supplements, which is called cyanocobalamin. And we use it as a, uh, a supplement underneath the tongue. You actually take it sublingually, and that way you don't have to worry about that one-inch area of the gut where you need um, uh, intrinsic factor to be able to absorb B12. Um, it absorbs right through the mucosa in the mouth, right into the bloodstream. And that's the most effective way to do it. And actually studies have shown that using sublingual B12 that way in the active form, methylcobalamin, can be the equivalent to getting B12 shots. Helps with energy, but even more importantly, it helps with nerve function and it helps with memory, focus, concentration. And I've had some, you know, some uh, elderly patients really spark up as far as their memory and their mental abilities when getting on a proper B12. Um, also, just a quick note, sometimes doctors go to, um, uh, you know, do, do blood tests and they say, oh, your B12 levels are, you know, high and B12 levels in the blood do not equate to your cells being able to use B12 efficiently. And so I've seen people who have supposedly high levels of B12 and yet they're not functioning the way they're supposed to. And when we use this sublingual form of B12, uh, you know, like I said, we see them start to uh, spark up a little bit. Um, okay, so I want to address a couple questions here. First from John, asked about niacin versus uh, slow niacin. Um, so niacin is uh, um, one of the B vitamins, and we use that. It can be used in high doses to help normalize cholesterol, to help raise HDL, to help lower LDL, maybe more importantly, to make uh, more fat fluffy molecules of LDL, which is really what you want. It doesn't matter how much LDL you have. If you have small, dense molecules, then that's when you're at risk. Um, I have a whole webinar about that, and I would refer you to the webinar to learn more about that. Um, uh, so, but the, the bottom line is, is that um, you need fairly high doses to affect that, and you can have um, Nice and causes flushing, and when you get too high of a dose, you you know your ears get red, and it's it can be very uncomfortable for people. And so there are forms of niacin that are slow release. There's a prescription one of the, one that's called niaspan. It's it's terribly um, liver toxic, and I and you know I, I rarely recommend it for people because of its liver toxicity. 
Um, there's, uh, there's other forms of niacin that are, you know, extended release uh, that are available over the counter. We've had some success with those. Um, John also asked about D3 and fish oil, and I would refer you to my webinar about um, the essential six because healthy fats like fish oil and D3 are um, two of those essential six and very, very important and, you know, should be taken by everybody. Uh, let's see, Steve is asking about, do I know anything about products from Univera and MLM companies? And I'm glad you asked that, Steve, because the next thing I want to talk about is multi-level products. And just here's some just general rules about this, and, and I want to explain, uh, you know, my feelings about this and help you understand. And, you know, for those of you in the, in the listening audience that use or take, you know, various multi-level products, um, uh, if you feel insulted by the words that I'm saying, I apologize for that. Um, these are some general rules about multi-level products. Number one, they always, 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 let me emphasize, always cost more than they should just based on the cost of the ingredients in those products. And if you really think about it, it, it makes perfect sense because you know, when you're buying something multi-level, you're supporting X amount of levels of people making money off of you purchasing that. Or if you're selling these products, people that are buying from you, you know, you get a cut and then people that are upline from you all get their little piece of it. And what that does is it increases the cost of the product and it increases that cost not at all based on the cost of the ingredients that are in that product. And I've seen some products where they could sell for 30 or $40 a bottle where the actual ingredient cost of the product is literally in the pennies. I've seen one that the bottle and the label of the product actually cost more than the ingredients that are in the product. And that, my friends, is a problem. Products that are sold one way or another should be based on the cost of the ingredients, not the market or the advertising budget or this multi-level scheme, if you know, if I can put it that way. Another one of the issues that I have a problem with are the quality of the ingredients that are in those issues, uh, that are in those products. It is very, very hard to demonstrate those. It's very, very hard to evaluate those because those companies do not disclose what's in their product or the quality of the ingredients that are in that product. And so here's one of the clues that you should look for that should be an alarm for you. You look on the label and it says proprietary blend of, and then it lists all those ingredients. And so it could say proprietary blend of 650 milligrams, and then it lists five or six ingredients. You don't know how much of the active ingredient in each one of those herbs or nutrients is in there. You don't know about the quality of the source of those. And that is a big problem. Let me give you some examples. Um, and, and I can tell you that I have researched many, many multi-level products over the years. I used to do a radio show about alternative medicine, and one of my listeners invariably would, you know, get involved with one of the multi-level companies and, you know, think that when they got me on their, you know, under them in the scheme that, I, you know, I was going to be the whale that was going to make them famous and rich because of my standing in the community and, you know, talking about it on the air. And so, and, and, you know, I never said to somebody, no, I'm not interested without really uh, exploring it. And so I've explored many, many of them. Here's just a couple examples. So there's, and these are just ones that are sort of new out there. I've been through all of them over the past 25 years, believe me. Um, and it's rare that I see one that I'm really, really impressed with as far as the ingredients go. And so uh, Protandum is a new one that's out there that is uh, gaining momentum because of its, uh, you know, ability to support glutathione production. And, uh, and you know, that's important in your body. So it has ingredients like um, milk thistle in it. I have no idea how much milk thistle is in there and or the standard. See, when you're using milk thistle, you need to make sure that you're getting a certain amount of silymarin, which is the ingredient that's the main ingredient or the important ingredient in there. And when you're taking a milk thistle product, you want to take one that is standardized to give you a certain amount. So a typical milk thistle dose would be 175 milligrams of milk thistle standardized to 80% silymarin so that you know you're getting 140 milligrams of silymarin per capsule. I know the cost of those ingredients. I know the cost of products out there. Um, what they're supplying in ProTandem cannot in any way be a proper amount that you need. Uh, the chia seed um, excitement out there these days. Again, 
Chia seeds are, are interesting. I know people that use them and get good results. And there's nothing magic about the multi-level one that supports 40 or $50 a month for a container of that stuff when you can buy white chia seeds that are processed and, and you know, you, uh, treated properly for $10. And so it's just the, the high cost. Also, just the last word about multi-level products is that, generally speaking, these are um, foods and or nutrients or supplements that come from exotic places where the people that live in those exotic places, you know, live longer and happier lives because they consume that, you know, noni and, and whatever. I mean, there's a, there's been a million of them over the years. And what I like to just point out to people is that it may very well be that if you put me on a beach in a tropical area where I didn't have to, you know, um, deal with the stresses of life here in Baltimore, that my health would be different as well. You know, and maybe seeing some bikini clad women run around, run around on the beach would be helpful in that vein as well. And so what I'm trying to point out is that we say, oh, well, you know, people from the tropics who eat noni live longer. And we assume it's because of the noni. And it may not be. It may be because of lifestyle and stress and all those other things that we know affect health, if that makes sense to you. So then I also wanted to say a word about Dr. Oz and his miraculous weight loss, you know, miracles that he talks about every day on the air. Um, I call it the Oz effect. And, you know, I was the, mm, I guess the unwilling beneficiary of this about a year and a half ago, because he started talking about a product, which is called optimized saffron. And he talked about it on the air. And I think this is the first one that he really talked about. And it made his hit the response he got from this, I think made his eyebrows go up and say, Oh, well, I should do this more because he's certainly done it since then. Uh, all of a sudden on the air, I mean, I literally, it was a Tuesday afternoon, I think, and he started talking about this. And all of a sudden on the website, because we happen to have a good uh, optimized saffron product, and at the time, the only one that I knew of that was on the market for a good price on, the, on our website, all of a sudden I got an order, another order, another order. Before I knew it, you know, I had gotten orders for 40 bottles within a day or two. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? And then realized that Dr. Oz had talked about it. And, you know, over the next two weeks, sold probably, you know, 250 bottles of this stuff went out of stock from the manufacturer, then it became available again. And, you know, it was uh, obviously a boon to business that way. But, and again, that's why I call it the Oz effect. And I can tell you every time Dr. Oz talks about some new miracle thing, because I get calls for it, people asking me about, you know, what to use and, um, uh, and how to use it and does it really work? Well, interestingly enough, out of those, you know, probably all told three, 350 bottles of that optimized saffron that we sold, I maybe got four or five reorders, which meant to me that it really didn't work for people the way they expected. So the number one thing is that there is, there are no miracle weight loss products. You just have to understand that if we have a problem with weight and we need to lose and lower our percent body fat, it takes work to do it. You can't just take a pill and have that happen in a healthy way, if at all. It just doesn't work that way. Some of these supplements and nutrients may be helpful as an additional tool when it comes to weight loss, but ultimately, you got to change your diet. You got to get refined sugars and carbohydrates out of your diet. You got to start moving. You got to get exercise. You got to reduce your stress. You got to sleep properly. All of those things are what need to happen. And if all of those things are happening, then some of these things may be helpful in maybe increasing metabolism a little bit or helping to slow the absorption of sugar from your stomach into your bloodstream and or clear that sugar. That's what all of these things ultimately are reported to do. So here's what he's talked about recently. You know, raspberry ketones, green coffee, green bean extracts, 7-keto DHA, the optimized saffron I told you about, Garcinia cambogia is one he's been talking about recently. And he talks about these things and reports studies about these things that lead you to believe that, oh, that's all you have to do to lose weight. And it just never, ever, ever, ever is true. I've used all these things. I've looked at all these things. There is some science behind all of these things that may be helpful. The optimized saffron is supposed to help with emotional eating. Um, you know, the coffee, green coffee bean extract is supposed to increase metabolism and, and uh, help your body use sugar more efficiently. The raspberry ketones are supposed to be a, a some sort of trigger or signal to help you get rid of fat. 
And none of those things are miracles. And if you rely on those as miracles to lose weight, you're going to be just as disappointed as everyone else out there. So now would be a good time to punch in any other questions that you may have um, of things that I didn't address. We've got just a couple minutes left um, today. I want to thank everybody for joining me. It's been, uh, it's been, wow, a quick hour. And truth is, as I said, I could have talked about all of these things more. I want to remind everybody also that um, in our archives on the, on the website are recordings of all of the web uh, the webinars that I've done over the past year and a half, more than that now, I think it's, uh, you know, 20 or 22 of them now um, uh, that are there, some really good topics. And uh, I would encourage you to share them with other people as well. Would love your feedback. Do not hesitate to call me in the office. Do not hesitate to uh, email me. You can get to me right through the website, wellbeinggps.com. And I really do thank you and appreciate your participation. Um, here's a question from Josh. Can you get too much of certain vitamins? Like in five hour energy, they have like 8,000% uh, of B6 and B12. Uh, is that bad? There are some nutrients that you can get too much of or out of balance. Generally the B vitamins, because they're water soluble, you know, it's kind of hard to hurt yourself. Um, and so B12, lots of times I'm using much higher dosages than the RDA. The RDAs of the B vitamins are, are woefully low. Um, and so generally, I don't get too uh, nervous or excited or worried about uh, getting too much of the Bs unless you're getting them out of balance. And that can happen with, you know, some of the B vitamins, including B6. And so um, I'm a big fan of getting your Bs in a more balanced form where you're getting all of them together. You know, B1, B2, B3, B4, B6, B12, folic acid, all of those together. Um, but thanks for the question, Josh. Appreciate it. And everybody else, thank you for participating, and I look forward to seeing you again here.